Welcome to the 12th episode of Foreign Correspondents Deeper into Hitchcock podcast. My name is Michał Leszczyk and I'm as usually joined by my co-host Sebastian Smoliński. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, um, it's a crazy time everywhere. And uh, last time when we spoke to you about murder uh, in this uh, podcast in which we go through every single movie in Alfred Hitchcock's filmography, we actually had a transatlantic connection because Sebastian was then in Ohio on his um, Kościuszko Foundation scholarship. And uh, we would never imagine then that our ne next episode would actually take place also online, but this time squarely within the confines of Warsaw, because unfortunately for security reasons, uh, Sebastian needed to come back from his scholarship. And right now he is in the Ursynów part of Warsaw. I'm in the Żoliborz part of yes, Warsaw. So we're something like 10 miles apart, I would say, more or less, maybe a bit less. Yes. Okay. Yes, ex ex uh, exactly. So, uh, well, w welcome home then. Uh, we all hope that uh, this crazy situation will end soon. And um, we uh, go on and we continue with uh, um, Hitchcock's filmography. And the time has come uh, for a film that seems to be very much unloved by most commentators. We are slowly inching our way towards the masterpieces of the 1930s. We are as excited as you are about reaching slowly to films like The Man Who Knew Too Much and uh, 39 Steps. But still, we have some steps to go. <laughs> it's not 39, but still some before we reach that peak of or early peak of uh, Hitchcock's career. And today, The Skin Game, a film that uh, even an author who uh, really uh, usually, you know, writes very, very lengthy passages on Hitchcock's films. I mean, Patrick McGilligan in his very long biography, he basically gives this film one page. Uh, so this gives you the idea of how minor it is in the filmography. But we will see. Uh, maybe actually the skin game today will uh, elicit some good responses uh, from us. So let's start by stating basic facts about the film. Uh, the Skin Game premiered in February 1931 and uh, it's another film in Hitchcock's filmography that he made at British International Pictures. It's based on a 1920 play by John Galsworthy. Uh, who was just one year away from winning his Nobel Prize, uh, but he wasn't a Nobel Prize winning author yet at that time. And uh, the play was highly successful. It was uh, adapted into a silent movie before. And, uh, uh, and in 1931, Hitchcock did this adaptation, which, and this is the first question to Sebastian, I would say, and this is not a controversial thing to say, it's very much in the style of Juno and the Peacock, the, the film that we talked about already, a film that was sort of criticized for being too stagey, not cinematic enough. So um, how did you find uh, the skin game? Was it cinematic enough for you? <laughs> so I had this double pleasure of, uh, you know, entering this story because uh, I've read the play, as I know that you've also, you've read the, the original play, John Galsworthy's play, and I had great fun uh, reading that play. Maybe great fun is saying too much, but I, I really liked it. I liked the, the banter between the characters. I liked the relationship, for example, between the the daughter and the, the old patriarch of this uh, rich family, of this um, uh, noble family. So Hillcrists, right? I, I like this, for example, this element. And then I was surprised because I think I haven't seen this movie earlier. So I just watched it to prepare to this, uh, to record this episode. And I was surprised that Hitchcock turned it into this pretty sour and rather um, pessimistic uh, adaptation. I was, I was surprised. So um, I must say I, I was a bit disappointed. But first I was, you know, just simply... Um, surprised that he didn't take the more, I would say, the more obvious route, which would be to take it into more or less a, a comedy, which then turns into a drama, but still somehow can stay as a, as a, this more of a light movie, like uh, like Murder or his several previous movies. But this one is not like that, I would say. 
Yes, I, I I read the play as well. I never read it before. Um, I um, definitely um, was uh, uh, surprised um, by the film because I saw it years ago, but my year my English then wasn't good enough actually to follow the action. So this was really the first time that I saw the film properly. And uh, well, maybe the first thing that we should mention is the plot of the play. Uh, a play, as I said, that Hitchcock actually saw in his initial run, in its initial run in the 1920, uh, back when you know he he didn't even start yet then to be a filmmaker. He was still, you know, working as graphic designer uh, for this cable company. So he was still a young, impressionable man who was soaking up a play after play after play. All the authors that uh, write about Hitchcock say that, especially in the late teens and early 1920s he was an avid theater goer he would simply you know watch everything that was on the british stage so and then it's evident also in his movies that he you know he had a great sense of the dramatic and uh, of shaping up the structure of a story story so he saw this play uh, and and he also saw the silent film which was uh, I never saw it. I didn't find it online, but it starred also Edmund Gwen as this uh, uh, figure of the pa- pa- patriarch, as you said. Um, Edmund Gwen, who will come back in Hitchcock's filmography in uh, Trouble with Harry. And uh, yeah, the plot basically is uh, this. It's it, it's technically, technically the, the play is a comedy because it ends you know in a, in a sort of optimistic way sort of mm-hmm. uh, meaning that the that you know Chloe doesn't die at, at the end in the film she she may have yes, actually died yes. but uh, it's two families uh, the hillcrists and the hornblowers the hillcrists are the landed gentry so old money basically and the uh, hornblowers are the nouveau riche industrialists new money who inch by inch are taking over the neighborhood in which um, uh, Hillcrists uh, live. Not a while ago, uh, Hillcrist, the patriarch, as you say, the father, uh, Mr. Hillcrist, he, uh, he sold some property, uh, some land to Hornblower, and there were some honorary points between them about how this land is to be used and not to be used. And, and yet Hornblower now is violating those previous arrangements by evicting people from cottages that belong, used to belong to um, Hillcrist. And basically there is this huge conflict between the old money that doesn't want change and wants to basically preserve this status quo and the new money, which is ruthless, which is vulgar, which is not rooted in the past, and yet which is extremely vital because it actually means progress and uh, it means industry, it means, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and and stuff and and you know this is the basics of the play and then it's also played out between the generations there's the figure of the daughter of Hillcrist and the son of uh, Hornblower and also there is a big sexual scandal at the very core which is that the daughter-in-law of Hornblower actually might have been a prostitute in her previous life and this secret which Mrs. Hillcrist knows may used may be used to win in this whole skin game, as the, the, the title title says. So the the title points to something very primal, something very violent. You know, there are all those niceties of civilization, and yet it's really a skin game. So it's really something very very primordial between you know uh, two men basically who want who want to destroy uh, d- destroy one another. Uh, so, uh, when you read the play and you watched the movie, did the performances of the actors, were they what you imagined when you were reading the play? Uh, yeah, actually, not at all. Um, I don't know why, but, you know, I've, re- I've recently read Pygmalion in original version, so now I probably approach this play as another, you know, witty, f- as, I, as I mentioned, witty, funny English comedy, and then... So I I envisioned, for example, the the um, the main duel between these two men, between uh, Mr. Hillcrist and uh, Mr. Holmblower, as more of a you know more of this um, like faster and more funny fight between you know some more 
Um, you were expecting to see a scribble comedy, just admit. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to mention that because that's from another, let's say, another dimension. But yeah, I, I, I was expecting some, some more scribble in it. Exactly. That's, that's what I wanted to say. And so, so I was surprised. I thought, for example, that Mr. Hillcrist, after all, would be more outgoing and more uh, that would have he would be a character that would have more agency but the way he's rendered in the movie uh, the way his the, the performance is directed and and uh, performed uh, he's more of a you know he's a really elderly very quiet and very uh, slow man so the slowness i just i was surprised by the slowness of this movie that hitchcock somehow i think he he changed this play into something more serious and let's say, less middle bro than it, than it was, I think. Yeah, even though in Hitchcock's later films we might have expected something a little bit wilder on the wilder side. However, when I read the play, I mean, the play didn't strike me as particularly funny. The, the characters were pretty ugly to one another. There wasn't really, um, you know, the, this whole banter between them wasn't especially funny to me. But uh, what I definitely got from the play was that I think... Goldsworthy's heart was closer to Hillcrist, and I think Hitchcock's heart is definitely closer to Horn- Hornblower, uh, which uh, it makes sense because Hitchcock wasn't of landed gentry, he was actually a shopkeeper's son. And uh, yeah, and uh, this is something that I think is quite evident because Ed- Edmund Gwen, the way he plays the part of Hornblower, Hornblower can be really nasty in the play, he can be really, really almost like provocatively brutal towards uh, Hillcrist, you know, all those mm, jibes and all the, you know, uh, uh, basically provocation on on his part is really mellowed down in uh, uh, skin game as it is on the screen. And I would say that Edmund Gwynn is actually kind of warm, kind of avuncular. He's, uh, you know, he's likable. He's very likable. And uh, and for me, the big giveaway... Uh, of Hitchcock actually siding with this character is this his first long conversation with the Hillcrists uh, that he has, which is one of those very, very long shots that uh, Charles Barr analyzes very closely in his book on Hitchcock's English movies. It's one of those very, very long shots. However, it's a shocking shot. I mean, nobody would shoot it like this right now because you have basically three people in a quite theatrical setting and yet the camera is focused only on one of them. We don't see really much of Mrs. Hillcrist. We don't see much of Mr. Hillcrist. I think the actors might have been angry at Hitchcock because he basically like cuts them out of the scene and camera just slowly pans back and forth and but sh- it shows uh, Hornblower. It's really focused on Hornblower. So I think that Hitchcock is mostly interested in uh, in that character. Yes, I would. Say. That's my intuition. Yeah, th- that's a that's a great point. Of course, uh, when we look a bit broader. So, for example, if we remember uh, not only Edmund Gwen's uh, later Hitchcock performances, but of course his performance from 1947, uh, The Miracle of um, 34th Street, when he's like. In this movie, he's a super likable character and, you know, this wannabe Santa Claus. So that's a, you know, that's, he's a very sympathetic, he has a very sympathetic face, you know, to, um, despite everything. And I agree that the shot you described uh, was really striking to me. I mean, probably this is one of these shots that were described by uh, Romer and uh, Chabrol in their book about Hitchcock as, you know, this inept shots from this movie, because uh, let's just mention that this movie is famous uh, among Hitchcock acolytes as, you know, being named as the worst of his movies by some, at least by by Chabrol and, and Romer, right? So you have this, um, this feeling that something's wrong here, that, you know, um, Charles Barr describes the, the later sequence when there is a pretty nice uh, shot reverse shot um, short scene between um, Chloe and Mrs. Hillcrist when they're entering the, the auction room, right? And that's employed pretty skillfully there. And in the shot you described, we are focused more or less, as you mentioned, on, on one character. And I think you can really feel that as a viewer. I think I had this feeling that there are, there are some shots missing, which is, of course, even stranger when you 
when you read that uh, Hitchcock shot this movie with several cameras working uh, at once, right? Because those were the times when they couldn't edit sound, right? So he, he was using several cameras and still there are these uh, 90 or more second uh, sh uh, shots. And of course, if you describe it the way you described, so the point of this shot is to make make us sympathize with uh, Edmund Gwen's character, Mr. Hornblower, then it really works. Um, and I think that's probably another reason is that uh, C.V. France's performance of um, Mr. Hillcrist is, in, in my opinion, as I mentioned, is not really effective. And even, you know, even Mrs. Hillcrist, uh, so Helen Hay, also from the original cast, I think she's good in the movie as the, because she's the real, let's say, she's the real antagonist uh, to Mr. Hornblower. Uh, it's not really, I think, it's not really the fight between two men, both in the play and in the movie, but between... Uh, Hornblower and Mrs. Hillcrist. Uh, so even she's a bit, uh, as you as you meant, as you described it, she's a bit tamed as a as a person. She's not mean enough, I think, in this movie. So that's that's also pretty strange because when this both the play and the movie start, you have this feeling that maybe it will go some other way. And since we are, you know, foreign correspondents looking at Hitchcock movies from this Polish perspective, um, I must tell you that I was reminded by at least two Polish works. One is the play Revenge by Fredro, which is like super classical Polish play, I think from uh, 19th century, right? 19th century play. Um, also two characters fighting with each other over a, um, a wall, I think, which... Um, uh, a wall which divides their their uh, properties, and also this cult movie com Polish comedy from 1960s, uh, Our Folks by uh, Sylvester Henczynski. Um, of course, the details are um, are different. There's not uh, not uh, not much about class tensions, and you know, Galsworthy's play is all about this qua class differences. Um, and I think that we we may assume that yeah, that you you're right that uh, Hitchcock somehow managed to change the the focal point of this play you know from this uh, let's say from trying to expose the nouveau riche uh, he changed it into a story that you know this nouveau riche are finally uh, fooled by this by the by the by the old money people and actually they use their own weapon i mean their weapon is like you know uh, reputation right so they use this weapon of uh, respectability and reputation against hornblowers. So that, that's pretty interesting. But what is striking, uh, I think, for viewers nowadays is that the first few seconds of the movie, you see this this uh, intertitle, this opening title, Talking Film by John Galsworthy, right? And it's, it's funny in itself because, of course, we know it's a Hitchcock movie, but still it was advertised as a, you know, as a movie, let's say, as a movie by a playwright, that it's really his movie because it's based on his play. And when we remember, and McGilligan mentions that, uh, how strict uh, how strict rules were, uh, you know, in operation at the time for directors who wanted to make, mm, who had to, I think, make movies based on plays that they couldn't change many lines that Galsworthy as the playwright in this case, or Sean O'Casey as in the case of Juno and the Peacock, they had to really... Uh, supervise uh, everything and they had this right to supervise and to decide which part of their play will make it to the movie and what will be excluded because there are some subplots which are excluded so um, I wonder how he how he did it how he managed to you know change this um, emphasis from one character to the other and still go away with it maybe that's part of his you know uh, his ability to survive. Yeah, it's. Um, I agree with um, everything you said, and uh, it's. Uh, you know, it's uh, funny to imagine um, the scene that McGilligan actually describes of Hitchcock um, visiting Goldsworthy at his manor and uh, witnessing this highly sophisticated, borderline snobbish conversation that he witnessed. Uh, apparently, you know, Hitchcock definitely in his origins was working class by aspiration and by his supreme taste and uh, also by collecting art which will, he will also do later in life he definitely aspired at least um to 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 higher classes uh, or it was highly um pleasurable for him to have people of higher classes to actually 
uh, you know, respect him and to see him as this great figure of cinema. So here you have material which, by the way, also is extremely dated, just like murder, because in murder we had this whole elab elaborate tension generated by the issue of uh, being a half caste or by transvestitism, which was treated as the you know non plus ultra of uh, of transgression. Uh, here, uh, the secret that Chloe has is by today's standards not a secret at all. I mean, it is a secret by the standards of you know Thomas Hardy and Tess and uh, you know those Victorian tales of you know a young woman who has a sexual past because a young marriageable woman in Victorian morality was supposed to have no sexual past. Here she has the sexual past and we actually don't even know if uh, if it entailed sex, the, the thing that she did, accompanying gentlemen to hotels to provide them with good alibis for their divorce um, cases because this is what she did. And yet it seems, and this is the supreme irony of this play but an irony that completely evaporates by now because it doesn't have any frame of reference is that as nouveau riche and as progressive uh, hornblower is and as much as he is disdainful of all hierarchies of uh, old money and privilege he's still extremely conservative when it comes to uh, sexuality and especially notions of female sexuality so even you know this this bulldog of progress uh, stops in his tracks the very second he know he he learns that you know there might have been a sexual past of of chloe and uh, and that it could actually be made uh, um, common knowledge that it would uh, get out so this is how they blackmail mail him into giving back the sentry this this piece of land that's so valuable to to them and uh, for me um hitchcock as much as he was attuned to feelings of guilt and of inferiority which uh, there's plenty of um evidence in his movies that he was attuned to those um, sentiments he's definitely identifying here with chloe and uh, with her fear of being exposed there's this also quite counterintuitive shot of chloe's face when she is horrified and she listens to jill and her father talk about her fate as as the this possible prostitute when uh, jill says to father that oh you know we are privileged we don't really know how it is to be you know that um that uh depraved and how how what she must have gone through it's the very opposite of but also it's close to the famous conversation in parasite when the poor you know uh, married couple is listening on to the comments by the by the rich couple you know that oh they stink you know they they here actually she listens to some words of sympathy you know the father actually says yes you know we don't know how it is you know it must must be very hard but we we don't get any intercutting it's just her face registering shame registering fear uh registering you know the pain of whatever she went through before that so i think for hitchcock definitely it's uh, hornblower even when he makes this, uh, you know, the vow and he's forced to sign the papers, his voice is like he's about to cry, you know, he's, uh, he's like very emotional, he's not angry, he's not like livid with anger, as he is in the play, you know, he's like a wounded lion in the play, and he's, he's like this wo wounded beast, and here now he's like this hurt old man, you know, who's whimpering and... Um, crying so i think that that yes for hitchcock and if we even consider how much class prejudice he mu he must have experienced in british society also i think that might have had to do something with the, his decision to become an american because he ultimately decided to emigrate to america and to become you know a self-made man in america which is at least in theory free of those class prejudices so uh, yeah i think the, the, there had to be a lot of resentment on his part towards those upper classes and i think this is why he doesn't really humanize uh mr hillcrest that much i mean you read the play you remember how much diminutive words and the 
tender words were exchanged between the daughter and the father. She kept, you know, talking to him, Dodo and stuff. And here it's very widely cut. You know, we don't see. There's one scene like that, that she's very tender towards him. So I, I, I think she he had no qualms about making them less sympathetic than the others. And I think that in terms of filmmaking, probably this auction scene is something that probably excited him because we have all this crazy cutting and panning between people bidding on the sentry. So uh, that, that's, the, that's the sequence in which it's really flowing, you know, the, his, his movie making juices are flowing. Otherwise, um, yeah, I, I think the limitations of sound at that era are quite clear. Uh, and it's uh, and it also if I didn't read the play, it would be difficult for me to follow the dialogue uh, because it's not that well recorded. And uh, but luckily I read the play, so I knew what they were saying. Yeah, um, I totally agree. Also, for those interested in reading the play and holding Amazon Prime account, uh, it on Amazon Prime it's uh, for Kindle users. It's free if you have this account. So we don't want to advertise that, but that's you know probably that's the easiest way to read it. Uh, certainly for us being now in Poland, and yes, I uh, agree with you. Um, you said it beautifully also about this uh, pretty famous auction scene. And of course, once again, we uh, look at this scene and we can compare it with um, subsequent Hitchcock's auction scenes. I was surprised that uh, I rewatched this scene from North Island, Northwest, which is, of course, one of the funniest scenes uh, in this movie, the auction scene. Actually, I uh, it made me laugh that somebody named this video from North by Northwest with Cary Grant bidding as a t trolling on auction. So this this modern word is used to, you know, to express this character's attitude, which is, of course, perfect. And that's a totally different scene. Of course, it's it's um, it's uh, shot in a totally different way. Uh, the camera almost doesn't move in North by Northwest in this scene. Everything's done in, in cutting. Here it's it's different. You can I think you can still see some of the excitement of late silent silent period with you know with this uh, late 1920 movies uh, movies from 1920s uh, that tried to you know express subjective states or to show how some car some characters could see something. So that's certainly there. And also because of this scene, such scenes, and because of this lengthy conversation scenes, there is this strange feeling that. Hitchcock's early sound movies are kind of schizophrenic, that they these are like always two movies in one. So in one movie, there are these lengthy, um, lengthy uh, conversation scenes uh, focused on actors, focus on their, their performances. Uh, let's just remind our listeners that similarly to um, several actors from uh, The Skin Game, also actors from uh, Juno and the Peacock also reprised their roles, their stage roles in Hitchcock's film. So you have this theatrical background and you have this, let's say, quote unquote, the second film, second movie, which is, you know, Hitchcock um, indulging in editing, in camera movement and also in sound. Um, the thing you mentioned about um, Hornblower uh, being able to be really nasty I think it's uh, emphasized, underscored in the play by uh, some descriptions of the sounds. For example, in the play, his his um, car is described as being always the, the, the noisiest car around, right? So like he's this uh, new money person. He's um, full of uh, he's full of himself. We could say he's also uh, pretty sure of him uh, his uh, his motivations and what he's doing, and he thinks he will win. And that's certainly emphasized in the play. Uh, here, Hitchcock also tried to convey it visually and audially in several scenes. Um, also, oft the, often described scene is the one taking place um, in the market. Uh, at the very beginning, it's also some something he added to the play, uh, to, the, to the adaptation. Uh, so we see that um, Hornblower is a, a pot maker, actually. So that's why also he's interested in this part of the land, because it is said that in this part of the land, there is uh, clay, a lot of clay that he may use to, you know, uh, do his, uh, to manufacture more of his, uh, more of his goods. And uh, there is also quick, quick cutting in the scene. And we see some of the, let's say this vernacular English countryside. Uh, maybe that's like, all these words mean the same, but still, uh, you know, some of the, of the atmosphere of this um, early 1930s in this case. And, 
these are these moments when this so-called second film really comes alive. But of course, I, I wouldn't say we should just look at these more showy scenes, because as you beautifully described, um, even in the plot itself, there are many elements that Hitchcock may may have really liked. Uh, I'm just surprised uh, that this movie didn't go and the play didn't go the other way, because uh, we have also the suggestion that it will be, for example, screwball comedy about in this more of a Shakespeare ma Shakespeare manner, right? Romeo and Juliet, um, a story about two children who are who don't have these prejudices, at least not as much as their parents. I mean, the the younger son of Hornblower and the daughter of Hillcrest. Uh, they like each other at all, but we don't get that movie. Um, actually, in the in the very last in one of the last shots, Hitchcock actually um, includes this. Um, Uplifting note, uh, you mentioned that he changed the ending and st we are not sure if um, Chloe actually stays alive after her attempted suicide. But we have uh, these two characters, the, the Rolf and Jill, uh, touching their hands, I mean, uh, coming together. So that's probably one um, spark of hope somewhere on the horizon. And also, uh, I remember one, one shot which I really liked. That's the shot, uh, maybe you remember, when they try to recover the body of Chloe from the from the pool. Um, and then we have this white shot which shows us the, the pool in the f uh, foreground and the house in the background with Hornblower and Hillcrest discussing something. So that's a shot giving us the the full the full view of the situation and I really liked the way it was staged and composed. So that's probably another of Hitchcock touches. In this in this movie yeah I think we covered all the major bases for this one uh, those long long takes of people talking uh, will reappear in Hitchcock in unexpected places like rope for example we'll see that's uh, you know uh, there are many scenes like like that uh, and uh, I think that this this is a powerful reminder of of the world that Hitchcock came from because it's difficult to for us, I think in 2020, to remember how stratified the British society was in the first two decades of the 20th century, where Hitchcock grew up. Um, you know, we are surrounded by different empowering narratives about you know the uniqueness of the individual and of you know the preciousness of difference. Hitchcock grew up in a very very different cultural milieu and this film is a product of this milieu this play touches upon some of the tensions of that system uh, it's very difficult i think to empathize with this play because it's so dated i mean it, it's 100 years old i mean this year it, it turns <laughs> 100 so um you know all those notions of the landed gentry and you know the, the progress being represented by pottery you know this is this is also <laughs> uh, quite quaint i would say so this is a very very old piece of theater which i i cannot even recommend like you know that that play i i don't feel <laughs> yeah, like yeah. there's only for hardcore yeah, hitchcock, for fans. hitchcock fans um and uh, yeah, we will see very soon that uh, Hitchcock had more interesting things to say about clashes between, you know, modernity and tradition. And this will be his major theme in many movies. Uh, we will see that. But in the skin game, I think it's useful to remember that he's staging a play that already was 10 years old. You know, that he saw it and it was a very popular play. And apparently this movie also was popular. It wasn't a failure. So this is a product of its time, of its place, of its director, of this culture. And as I said, next year, Goldsworthy was awarded the Nobel Prize and then he died <laughs> one year after that. So, so this was the end of, the, of an era, you know, that, of that kind of a, uh, of a play. So, um, and if, if we uh, definitely after this one, we can be hungry for something a little bit crazier. And we will get it in the next film that we will talk about, which is one of the craziest films he made. This is a film called Rich and Strange, which 
is rich and strange. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to that because I haven't seen it in many, many years. And I remember that it, uh, it, it was really fun. So I'm looking forward to that. Do you have any uh, closing remarks um, on the skin game? Just the last one, which just, you know, confirms what you said, is that um, most of us encountered American Hitchcock first, right? You know, his American movies are obviously much, much more popular. So it's really, I just wanted to say that it's, it's, it was a, it's a great adventure for me to watch his and revisit his British movies to see, you know, how his art and his storytelling changed also when it comes to content. So we are now discussing all these pretty obscure British movies and getting this taste of uh, class tensions and uh, these walls dividing one people from the other. And then we'll suddenly, you know, we'll, we'll change um, um, surroundings completely and we'll, we'll enter into his American movies and that will be something totally different. So I think it's just, it's just pretty important to remember, you know, when he came from and what were his first uh, narratives about. Yes, and we will definitely find bits and pieces of those narratives later on. I mean, if we think about Mrs. Danvers and her disdain for the new Rebecca, I mean, the uh, you know, in the way she's so begrudgingly yeah, and uh, the birds, the birds, and the birds also, exactly. I would say. So it will be there. You know, the class is not going away in in Hitchcock's films. It's just that this film is a quite straightforward um, critique, I would say, in 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 the way that it was also written for the stage. So uh, yeah, so this was this was fun. I, I'm really happy that uh, we revisited this film because I always had a sort of bad conscience because I, I I I I knew I saw it on VHS, but I knew that I didn't really see it because you know I I couldn't really follow the dialogue when I watched it 15 years ago. So now I finally feel like I saw this skin game. So I'm very happy about that, and I'm looking forward to Rich and Strange. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for being with us and for all your all your, all your comments. Recently, we received several very nice comments, and uh, many of you are writing to us, you know, to share to share your stories about Hitchcock and your uh, Hitchcock adventure, which is really great. Let's keep it that way, and let's hear each other soon. Yes, absolutely. And please write us at hitchcock.podcast at uh, gmail.com. Uh, please also visit our fan page on Facebook foreign correspondence deeper into Hitchcock and like our fan page and uh, please um, spread the word uh, we are continuing this project and we are only three films away from this golden peak of the 30s so uh, we'll, we really are very impatient to get there but there are three quite interesting movies on yes. the way okay so thank you again and thank you for listening this was another episode of foreign correspondence deeper into Hitchcock